This is the Idea Time Show with Dr. Joe North, helping facilitators expand their creativity, confidence, and impact through the power of innovation in action. Gain confidence as a facilitator, confidence with the technology, and confidence with your content and event design. Tune in every week for practical tips, strategies, and interviews that will accelerate your personal and business success. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe North. I'm speaking with Amanda Salvaratnam, who is the Director of Research and Enterprise at the University of York in the UK. Now, Amanda is a real expert on innovation, on commercialising innovation, and getting research out there being used in the community for real with businesses so that it can make impact. We talk about how businesses and other organisations can connect with universities for knowledge exchange and innovation so that um, all of that opportunity is is accessed and optimised as far as possible. It really is a value-packed episode thanks to Amanda's insight and the generosity of her sharing her experience. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it and get lots from it. Amanda and I would love to hear what you think. So without further ado, let's go straight to the episode. Amanda, it's brilliant having you on the show. We've known each other for a very long time, haven't we? Is it about 13, 14 years or something like that? It probably is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just to share a bit about you, what you do and how you got to where you are, because uh, I know all about you, but it'd be wonderful if everybody else watching and listening could, could know a bit too. Okay, well, I'm Amanda Selvratnam. Um, I'm the Associate Director at the University of York in the Research, Innovation and Knowledge Exchange Directorate. So what that actually means is that I'm responsible for getting the research in the university out into the public domain to be used in whatever format that takes, whether that's used by business, used by an individual, used by a community group, used by a social enterprise. So it's all about, from my perspective, getting our research into use outside of the university. So I've got several teams doing lots of different things and uh, I try to help coordinate that across the university. Fantastic. Sounds like a really interesting, busy, varied role that you've got there. So how did you get into that? What's your journey been? Um, I guess my journey's always been problem solving. So right from my first degree and my first job I was I've always been solving problems so it's been about identifying a problem and not necessarily me solving it but finding the solution through other people through other resources etc so I guess in in some ways I can look back and think maybe that was a quite a natural progression to going where my whole role is about helping use resources to solve problems Um, but I came up from doing bench research um, at both a university and in a large pharmaceutical company. And then I went into working in commercial intelligence. So again, looking at what other organisations were trying to do to solve the same problems that my organisation was looking at. Um, And then I started delivering training, um, running a training company, and, and eventually ended up I guess when I moved to the University of York, starting to incorporate all those problem solving, knowledge exchange, delivering teams into one one grouping. Um, so wasn't planned. Um, would would I use the same route to get there next time? Probably, because I've really enjoyed all my elements of my career. And I think having that breadth of experience has really helped me get to where I am. Yeah, they say that um, life meant, makes sense when you look at it backwards. Yes. Don't they? Um, that it, yes. You know, but the, the, the journey is often emergent and opportunities arise and we find things that are interest, interesting to us and we discover things. And then mm-hmm. it sort of stacks up with, with hindsight how we've got to and why as well. And yes. um, you're at the University of York and York is a beautiful city and it's an amazing university, isn't it? Oh, it's fabulous. Yes. I mean, the University of York is mainly um, on the outskirts of the city, but we've got a couple of um, smaller units in the city, which I love going to because York's so beautiful. And and people think of it as being a a, a heritage city, a city in the past, but actually it's a really innovative city. And actually there's loads of history of innovation 
Um, so the guilds, many of the guilds started in York and the innovating, the entrepreneurs, you can find the history of entrepreneurship right back through the, dec the centuries in York. So it's a great place to be. And um, yeah, we're definitely a future looking city uh, with a yeah. fantastic past. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great place to be. And it's a great. And I think um, the University of York are doing some amazing things for for businesses from pre startup small businesses all the way through to the big corporates um, as well. And that's where knowledge exchange um, comes in, which, of course, is, is our is our theme for today, um, knowledge exchange and innovation. So yeah. as a pro and as an <laughs> expert, <laughs> yeah. what does um, tell us what knowledge exchange um, is in practice what is it what does it mean and why should we be doing it and if so when for me knowledge exchange is the process by which we as a university and that could be through individuals or, or, or other means as I, as I said kind of earlier on get our research out into the into use yeah. so it can take many many different forms it could literally go from something on Twitter where you're just telling somebody about something you found out or an interesting piece of knowledge right through to a collaborative piece of research where you're working with a company directly to solve a problem and everything in between from commercializing our research to make things that solve problems. So um, we may have some sensor research that measures air quality and actually we may commercialize that um, and develop a, an air monitoring sensor that is better than what's out there. Uh, that's, that's one version. We may hold a public engagement forum where we explain our research to a group of interested individuals or for people that we want that research to make a difference to and get their feedback on that. And that will help inform our research even more. So it takes many, many different forms. Um, training is another way that we deliver our, our research. So, Academics across the institution are doing some amazing research and some of that research and some of that um, theory and practice needs to get out into the into the world. So whether that's training junior doctors or training policymakers or training people that do robot robotics and, and engineering, then uh, we have many staff that will change their research or convert their research into a training program. So lots of different ways. And. And that's the knowledge exchange part. But of course, the, the important bit is the impact. So what difference does it make? So we do knowledge exchange so that our research can make a difference. Um, and that's that's the process from, from my point of view. It's a continuum. From re If research doesn't have an impact, I, I would say, what's the point? Now, there would be some people that say there is research for research sake. And I do understand that. But that in itself is an impact because you're you're informing you're building the body of knowledge um what i want to do with that knowledge is make sure it makes a difference to somebody something or some place yeah and i suppose knowledge is is like stepping stone so you acquire some knowledge that knowledge in itself might not be immediately useful or or applicable applicable i should say in in the real world but actually it might be a stepping stone to more knowledge that that would be so it's an approach to yes. discovery isn't it as well and yes um, I understand that from from a un, from universities in general, from um, from from their perspective, there are there are three missions, aren't there, which are about um, research, learning, and yeah. and knowledge exchange. So this is a really important part of what universities are doing. Um, and I think universities are amazing places. You know, the University of York is an amazing place, and I'm really proud to have um, a great relationship with the University of York um, and, and to work with you. Um, but if you're from the outside looking in and you've not had that contact before, they can seem quite complex, impenetrable places. You've got all those amazing disciplines and subjects and people doing all incredible things. So um, how do people sort of access all of that? If they're listening and thinking, oh, I'd love to you know, <laughs> talk to the university about some stuff that um, will be relevant for our business, for instance. Yeah, I fully agree. Universities can seem really impenetrable. Um, and it's not just feeling impenetrable if you're a small business. You can feel impenetrable if you're one of the big four companies in the world. They can still go, mm -hmm. I have no idea how to get in contact with the university. 
But I guess what I would say is that now more and more, if not every university in the UK, will have some type of front door. Um, so whether that's going to a web page and looking for services for business or working with the University of York or whichever university, um, they will have engagement people. It, it all comes down to terminology and and the types of people that or the names that we use for people who engage with our external partners will vary from engagement officers to business development officers to business engagement officers. So there's certainly ways in now. And I think most universities, again, if not all, have developed fairly sophisticated processes internally. So if somebody comes knocking on the door and, and speaks to me and I go, oh, it's not me. Actually, who you want to speak to is our student internship bureau. Then we do have good signposting and, and kind of cross referrals. So and I guess the other thing is there hopefully there is no wrong door and there's no wrong question. So that, I think, is the thing I want to get over. Yes, we can feel as if we're impenetrable and oh my goodness, I didn't realise the university did that. But but honestly, just ask, mm. um, because universities are really keen to work with partners because we don't want to sit there in isolation. We don't sit there in isolation. We work with hundreds and hundreds of companies and thousands of individuals, but we're always looking for more partners because there's more problems to solve. There's more research we can do together. There's more opportunities to exploit, more challenges to address. Yeah, absolutely. The world that we're in um, it is changing so rapidly. We've got such yeah. big global challenges that affect us all in terms of the environment, the rate of technological change. Um, I was reading that uh, chat GPT, the, the AI solutions, the fastest adoption of technology um, yeah. in, in the world um, with something like, I think it was 60 million um, people downloading it almost, almost straight away. And, and getting yes. on board with crashed, that. I think it crashed the server, didn't it? Yes. Again, yeah, yeah. Time it goes on the news, it's like, oh, you can't get on it for a while. Yeah. But no, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. The power of that is is phenomenal, um, and that will transform not just knowledge exchange, but also teaching and things like that. So that there's a whole mind shift that needs to be done. And I know some people are calling for for that innovation to stop because it's too disruptive. But I think I think. We've got to find ways, as we have with all other technologies, of how to to utilize it to the best in the best way that we possibly the, can. The, yeah, for the greater good. good. For the greater good. good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's Elon Musk, isn't it, who's saying let's have yes, a, yes, a six please, month break. Do. Yeah, and just just make sure we do yeah. this. Um, so I can I can see where it's coming from, but, but yeah, we've got to find ways of using these things. And of course, it's knowledge exchange. So, yeah. um, so how does um, from a university perspective, how does that work in terms of getting that that collaboration and people opening up and sharing information and sharing knowledge, especially when you've got things like intellectual property to consider when you're working with external uh, partners? Yes, I mean, again, very often knowledge exchange or kind of trade secrets and all that side of thing can, can be seen as, as a blocker. But certainly at York, we we will have quite in-depth conversations with, with potential partners about our research and our, and our kind of expertise, the expertise and the research that might be going on in the company to find opportunities for us to work together. And if it becomes apparent that actually we'd like to disclose something that that has some intellectual property rights, then, then we will sign and ask companies to sign a, a confidentiality agreement. And very often companies will, will want that set up quite quickly because actually they don't necessarily want to tell us about what they're doing and their challenges and their, their opportunities and their potential new markets they're wanting to go in and, and might need some support. So again, that should never be, be a blocker. Um, in many ways, they should be enablers because it then allows you to have that freedom of, of conversation. Um, and I mean, there's been lots of things in the press about kind of universities wanting to keep hold of all their intellectual property, um, which which to a certain extent is true. We want to make sure that those individuals who discovered these amazing things on both part in both parties or all parties sometimes it's many many individuals working together to develop something um, so we want to protect them and, and make sure that they have they get 
kind of reward for that type of work and what they've been doing, but not at the expense of not being able to exploit that research. So it's all about making sure that the the ideas that are generated um, can have some value. And in many cases, that value is financial through patenting, licensing, etc. Um, and much of that value doesn't go to the academic. More, more often than not, they put that money back into their research mm. so that they can do more research. So it's it, it reinvesting, yes, yeah. a reinvestment. So, yeah. yeah. So it shouldn't it shouldn't stop people, and we're we're always keen to make sure that we can find ways to to engage in a in a two way process. Because and that that's brilliant and. I know the knowledge exchange sounds great in theory, and it is great in theory, and it can be great in practice, of course, uh, as well. Yeah. But how do you, um, what's the process, what's a step-by-step guide in terms of how you might um, implement a knowledge exchange process that, that works for everyone? Can you give us the, the headlines of what this, what that involves, what the steps are? The, the first one is, is that kind of discovery phase. So it, and, and building trust, I mean, the whole way along it, your aim is to 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 start to trust um, the, the the partner and to identify areas of mutual benefit. So more often than not, it will start with either myself or, or one of the people I work with meeting a an organisation or an individual uh, and and realizing there's something there that actually interests us both. Um, where that relationship can come from can literally be anywhere. So I, I, I was out last night. I was running with somebody who'd never I'd never run with before, told me about his partner who worked in a company. I said, actually, the area that company's working in looks really interesting. Can you, I'd like to just have a chat with her. Later that night, I got a little WhatsApp saying, oh, I'm so-and-so. Uh, my husband said that uh, we could should have a chat about our work and your research. So it can come from something as serendipitous as that, or it can come from us going to a specific meeting to meet a specific organisation or organisations. And then very often it's a matter of sitting down, explaining what what the challenge is that both organisations are trying to, to figure out, and then working out what's the best approach to solving that problem. Now, sometimes it's it's a skills issue. So a company is saying, oh, we're, I don't know, we, we want to grow, but we've got kind of a block in terms of people that we can move forward to take on new responsibilities our response to that may be ah oh, we've we've got some great training that will help you um, develop those people as strong leaders that that might be the initial knowledge exchange activity we do as that company or relationship develops then they may say actually we, we've got some research and you've got some really good research is there a way that we can work together and and so we may say actually there's a great process where we can find somebody who works with you in your company, but is actually being supported academically and with research directly from the university. And you can have that person for three years. Um, There'll be some costs, but it won't be as high as employing that person on a normal research contract. And you'll have the whole of the university support, research support behind you. So that might be another way. As part of that research develops, we may find that there's some some new knowledge is developed and we go, oh, actually between us, we could exploit that. We could license that to your client base because actually that's what your clients or your, your supply chain is looking for. So very often it's an iterative reviewing type process, mm-hmm. um, but it's done through conversation, through discussion um, in, a, in a step-by-step way. And there's, there is no A to Z. You may go A, Z, but then you may come back to B and C. Um, it all depends on the problem, the opportunity and the kind of partners involved. Yeah. And um, the University of York and, and, and other universities as well, I'm, I'm sure, have some amazing um, internship, student project uh, opportunities as well and that are really well set up um, and, and are very keen for students to go and get that industrial uh, business yeah. experience um, uh, as well. So they're, they're another, I think that's a great way of, of doing knowledge exchange um, as well yes I mean, stu- student teams we throughout the year we from all sorts of different departments and mixtures of departments we, we develop student teams that will go out and work with companies and it might be developing a new marketing strategy for a company it might be doing some surveying for another um 
we've got a, a lovely um, initiative at the moment, which is around community engaged students. So that's students going into community groups and helping them um, with their social enterprise activities or their other kind of community activities. And again, it's in those situations, it's volunteering. Um, but we as the university provide some support for the students to uh, to cover some of their, their costs. But it's a great opportunity for social enterprises or smaller community and charities to have access to, again, the expertise of the university students, but supported by senior academics behind the scenes who will make sure that the project is well managed and well delivered. So, yeah, an internship is a great way. It's your, lo- it's your long term interview, isn't it? The internship, you get somebody in for 12 weeks, six months, a year. And at the end of it, you go, actually, we would like that person full time. And we've, we've done all the interviewing because we've seen how they work. So, again, great resource. And. Um- I'm just really impressed with how easy the university makes it for for businesses to employ and work with um, interns and students on yeah. projects because the University of York certainly puts um, in certain schemes the students on their own payroll. They do, um, yeah. and there are all sorts of of, um, of benefits and and so on for the employer from a, a cost point of view. Yeah. So, um, so I think it's really really well set up. Now, for knowledge exchange, one thing and in innovation generally. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I strongly always really encourage people to do is to grow the networks and go to places and talk to people that you know are also outside of your immediate area of expertise, your industry or, or sector. Yeah. Um, you're a, a really strong networker um, yeah. as well. So what what tips would you have for um, for innovators in terms of actually growing that network and feeling confident about getting out there? And what are the ben- what are some of the benefits that you've seen? I think the biggest benefit is getting out of your immediate circle, because I think it's very easy for, um, I don't know, scientists to engage with scientists. You go to scientific conferences and you speak to scientists. But actually, you go along to something where there's creatives and you, and you suddenly have a different perspective. So I think it's looking For me, it's looking for opportunities that take you outside of your comfort zone, but can bring you a different perspective on what you're doing. So a lot of what we do has to be networking with potential clients. But if you think of some of the technology developments that we've had recently, so, for example, we've got a great um, initiative around um, assuring autonomy. So as systems become more autonomous, you need to be you need to make sure that they're safe. Um, and that all the kind of wraparound, be that insurance or safety, et cetera, is, is monitored, managed and is appropriate. Um, and we focus very much on autonomous vehicles, but actually getting out and speaking to people in the health sector or other engineering sectors is a great way of seeing the potential in your ideas or opportunities in a different sector and from a different perspective. So I think it's it's trying to look and, and being innovative in how you network. So you can be innovative in kind of your ideas for your business and things like that, but actually apply those same thinkings to, to your networking. Um, yeah. And I think if you're, if you're passionate and you understand your business and you understand what challenges or opportunities you're facing, then you've always got something to say. Um, yes. yeah. But the other thing is, is be the listener as well. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so so important isn't it and um it's interesting because you talk about uh, autonomous uh, vehicles and uh i work as with ports and in the maritime industry uh, a lot as well and autonomous shipping is is on right. its way so so yeah there are other other conversations um around that too so it, it is it's about broadening horizons and listening yeah. isn't it yeah, um, and, and getting the signals of change as well because I think we, we've got our ear to the ground we, we get a sense of how things are, are moving are moving forward so when you're facilitating knowledge mm-hmm. exchange sessions uh, with multidisciplinary teams which I know is something that you yeah. do a lot yeah. you get all, the, yeah. all these different ways of thinking and different agendas and interests and everything together what would be your top facilitation tips for for, t- for facilitating a knowledge exchange workshop I think to to deliver to to deliver the facilitation in a way that gets rid of any any preconceived ideas and plans and thoughts. So, I mean, I, I've taken loads of tips from you over the years in terms of your creative facilitation, the way that you you kind of put people into a situation where 
they have to think differently about their problem. And I think that for me is the first thing is to kind of almost remove yourself from the problem and come at it with a completely open mind. Um, and I love some of the work that, that you do around kind of there's no idea is a bad idea. Be as wacky as you want. Be as kind of ambitious as you want. And then you focus in and in and in and you keep asking the questions, keep reviewing. So so I think for me, it's about being as big and bold as you can at first and getting everything out there. And if it does take you off on a tangent, that's fine. Let's explore it. But also let's close it down when when it's ready to close down. But making sure that you somehow bring all those ideas together. So I think it's letting people have the freedom. And the other thing that I, I always like is having lots of different types of activity, because I think if you so, for example, if you just went into a, um, a facilitation session and all you did was every 20 minutes you stand with one other person, you have a conversation with them about issue X and then you go and share it. And then next 20 minutes you do that and you do that for two days and you'll have lots of ideas. Loads of stuff will come out of it. But that's no good for the creatives. That's no good for people that like something visual. So I think it's making sure that you utilize all those different ways of engaging the whole mind. Um, and I mean, I can remember with you, we all being sent off outside to pick an object. And then when we came back, we had to describe our problem using the object. Mm -hmm. And it just get something going in your brain that releases something more creative. And, and I think to me, creativity is the way to innovate and the way to self solve problems. So, yeah. so that would be what I would do. And I would use Joe North's tips all the time. Oh, thank you. That's, that's really kind. Thank you. I do remember that um, one group came back with a student. Um, and said, but the student had given Found permission and was well up for it and uh, and actually it, pr it proved really fruitful it gave um, a different perspective so yeah. um so that, that's great and um you are very involved in knowledge exchange at a national and global level international level you're involved yeah. in praxis oral aren't you so yeah. so just tell us a bit about praxis oral what that is and there are conferences and things coming up soon there are there are indeed. Yes. So Praxis or Oral is effectively the trade association for anybody involved in knowledge exchange. So there are a lot of universities, obviously, in membership, but we do have businesses as well, because, of course, there are people in business who are doing knowledge exchange all the time. Uh, there are business development people. So it, it's a network for people who want to do knowledge exchange. And it 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 helps address through through the network, not not just what issues are we all facing and what sort of what are the new and innovative approaches to doing knowledge exchange. But it also continues to raise awareness on the government agenda at the importance of knowledge exchange for delivering what the government wants around kind of industrial strategy and, and economic growth, etc. Um, we've got a conference coming up in June in Nottingham, which is open for absolutely anybody who's got an interest in knowledge exchange. And we'll, we will cover things from patenting and IP protection through to how to engage with the public, um, how to deliver better um, training, but also what skills and competences do people working in knowledge exchange need? How do we develop those? How do we drive that growth of the profession? Um, because one of the things we want to do is, is help the UK recognise knowledge exchange as being a profession. Um, and you can be a knowledge exchange professional as an academic, as somebody in business, but also in somebody in a kind of service, service support role, such as uh, the teams in my area. Yeah. Um, and the, the UK HE sector is taking knowledge exchange very seriously. So we have a concordat, so a kind of guideline and framework that we uh, that we're signing up to which is about making sure we've got the culture right in our organizations to be able to support people to do good knowledge exchange so that we get that impact and it's really important that the structures are there that the support is there and that the skills are there um, on both sides be the knowledge exchange doers so the people that deliver training or do the commercialization as well as the people that support support them so so there's loads going on and, it, and it's really exciting to be involved in Praxis Oral of which I'll be the chair next year um so uh, yeah it's, it's that's, yeah, yeah that's awesome what we'll do is we'll put um I'll put links to Praxis Oral and all of that in in the show notes oh, so um so when you're when you're when you, if you're listening to this and you're interested in 
in Praxis Oral and the conference, then, then just have a look at the notes below and you'll find all the links and info that you need underneath uh, underneath this. So um, so just, just um, finally then, um, what's your favourite example of a, a knowledge exchange that has had some impact or was really interesting? It could be as big or a small impact. It doesn't have to be, you know, world changing. But <laughs> some you think, yeah, that was a really, really good project and outcome. Yeah, I mean, we've got an absolutely fabulous project going on in York at the moment, which is has kind of developed in in a way that I think has probably surprised a lot of people. So it's called Street Life and it's a uh, an initiative that involves our archaeology department, our music department and our English department and the high street. So like many cities, York unfortunately has areas across the city where we've got empty shops. And I think that's probably the same all over the country. The, the role of the high street has changed in recent years and certainly since COVID. And so we, we took over, the University of York took over an empty shop on our main shopping street in York. And the idea was to bring people into that empty shop to get them to look at the history of our high street, but also comment on what the future could be, what the future high street might, might look like. Um, and that's been absolutely amazing in terms of looking at how creativity and the arts can help people who wouldn't normally engage with higher education, certainly, and the planning process, absolutely no way. Who likes to look through a, a, a new planning proposal from a council, let alone yeah. your neighbours? Nobody likes to do that. So how could we engage people to have a voice? Because it's really important as the future of the high street changes, that it actually is fit for purpose, that it, that it provides an environment for people to work, live, play, be happy, well-being, all that sort of thing. But if people don't engage at the planning process, how do you get them to engage? So we've had things such as um, a 3D model where people have been able to move buildings around and put things in the, in the landscape to say, actually, if we did that with the high street, what about this? We've had art exhibitions. We've got a piano in there where people can just come and sit and play. And then after they've been in the room, and there's an old print, printing press as well, because York's um, got a big, strong heritage of print. So we've got a medieval print press and people can see that working. And then after that, we ask them, what's your view of the high street now? Do you think of the high street as just for shopping? Do you think we could re-envision the high street as being something more than just either a walkthrough on the way to work or a place you go on a Saturday to shop? Um, and that, that's that been an absolutely fabulous um, example of knowledge exchange that, I, I, well, you couldn't think of it two or three years ago and, and the bringing of those academics together. So, so that I've just, I've, and I've really enjoyed yeah, being in amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? And um, that's brilliant. So um, if people want to get in touch with you or the university of York, uh, how, or, or practice oral, I've said, we'll put the details below, yeah. but how would you like people to, to reach out if they'd like to know more or, or, or explore working with the university? Yeah, I mean, the, the easiest way is um, just to email business at york.ac.uk, which is our kind of open email for anybody wanting to engage with the university. Of course, they're more than welcome to uh, to contact me by email. My my, I'm sure you'll put that up on the thing. I will. Um, our website, if you just search for University of York UK, because there is a York University in Canada, uh, University of York UK, then we've um, clearly on the front page got working with business um, or working with the university, so click there and you can get in to, to uh, contact people through through there. And you're very active as well on LinkedIn, aren't you? Oh, so, yes, of course, LinkedIn, yes. Yeah, yes Amanda Silver um, uh, yeah. on LinkedIn. And uh, you're doing some amazing things outside of work as well, so you have a an incredible run coming up. Is it how many weeks did, <laughs> is it? Four, three five weeks, weeks, three weeks, three, three weeks tomorrow. I shall yeah. be running, hopefully, in dry weather across the North Yorkshire Wolds, yeah, um, for, for 14 hours. <laughs> so, tell it just tell us um, why you're doing because this is incredible, everybody listening. This is really incredible. So, just tell us a little bit about that story before we close. 
Well, I'm running for Kidney Re Research UK because a year ago I donated one of my kidneys to my son who had renal failure. Um, pleased to say that all went well. He's uh, exceptionally, well, one so much better than he was before. He's getting married in the summer. And I just thought that was such a gift, one for me to be able to do it, but two for him to be able to receive that kidney. But it's only possible because of research. I mean, talk about knowledge exchange. I mean, the research that goes on and is funded by Kidney Research UK is phenomenal and it does have an impact. It literally saves lives. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you. So for me, I wanted to do something that was a, a struggle for me because I know people on dialysis, they go through something grueling for several hours every week, every year. And I just thought I can put myself through 14 hours of grueling running just to raise money. And that's what I'm doing. So in three weeks time, I should be running on the North Yorkshire Wolves um, raising money for Kidney Research UK. Amazing. That's so, that's so incredible. And you are such an inspiration, um, such an inspiration through through your running and everything you're doing for, for kidney research and, and what you've done, the, the process you've been through. But you're also a huge inspiration when it comes to getting people together, driving great outcomes and in many, many ways, making the world a better place through through knowledge exchange and collaboration. So, um, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. And uh, it's been great having you. Thank you. No, it's been absolutely great. I've, I've really enjoyed talking to you. And I like like you, I can throw it all back at you and say I've learned so much from you um, over the years. And, uh, yeah, I just love your podcasts and all the training and all that kind of creative approach that you take to life and work and everything so thank you very much it's been a great uh, great time thank you amanda thank you for tuning in to the idea time show brought to you by dr joe north don't forget to subscribe to our channel and access more completely free resources at bigbangpartnership.co.uk forward slash resources we'll see you next time